This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. One of the most difficult, if not the most difficult part of running a business, any business, particularly a professional services business, is uh, managing the people, managing the business, and uh, do it in such a way that you spend way less time at it and are way more effective at what you're doing. And today we're going to discuss five skills um, that will really help you develop into that better manager and really that, that excellent manager. Because the reality is, yes, we're owners, but we're also managers and we have to manage that practice that we, that we are running. Um, with us today, we have very special guest, David Dodson, who um, has an enormous amount of experience. I'll let uh, David in introduce himself in a second. His book is The Manager's Handbook, Five Simple ste Steps to Build a Team, Stay Focused, Make Better Decisions, and Crush Competition, which all of those sound really good, David. So thanks for being with us. And uh, if you would, just take a minute and, and introduce yourself and a little bit of your background. Sure, Tom. So as you said, my name, my name is David Dodson. I wrote the book, The Manager's Handbook. Most of my career was spent as an entrepreneur. I ran a number of businesses, seven businesses over a period of time. The business I have now is an investment firm. And what I always observed was I would look over my shoulder and there would be one of my competitors or a vendor or a customer who just seemed to be so much better at getting stuff done than I was within my organization. And when I was later asked to return back to Stanford Business School, which is where I, I got an MBA there and an undergraduate degree, but I was asked to come back to, to, to teach there, I got to kind of put my academic hat on or my professor hat on, if you will. And I started really looking at this and I became obsessed with the idea about why are these people so much better at getting stuff done? And as I did it and I studied it, I found that there were five things, five skills, Tom, that they all shared. There were no exceptions. And when I looked at those skills, what was remarkable for me was I thought, you know what? We can all learn those skills. It's a little bit like if I said, well, let's, you know, I've never golfed. I don't know, Tom, if you're a golfer or not, but I, I, I'm a miserable golfer. But if you went out to teach me how to golf, you'd teach me how to hold the club. You teach me how to where to have my feet and the difference between a driver and a putter. Each one of those is pretty accessible to learn. Eventually, you put it all together and you can golf well. Well, the same thing I found was true with these five skills of management. So when I wrote the book, The Manager's Handbook, what I did is I took the five skills, which were universal among all of these people, and I broke it into a series of sub skills. And then I wrote each chapter in as few words as possible because the people who want to buy my book and want to read my book are busy people. They're business owners like I was. And I remember when I was a business owner, I barely had time for meals. I did not have time to read lots and lots of books on single subjects. So I want to get 250 pages of as much content as possible in a single book. I, I, I love it. And I, you know, our listeners are very practical and this is a very, very practical show, um, uh, generally speaking anyway, um, David. So I really appreciate, I'm sure um, as we're all so busy, uh, we all appreciate making things simple, uh, making them understandable and to the point. So if, if you don't mind, um, uh, I would like to really kind of walk through the five skills. I, I will tell you, I'm, I'm here to learn because I am not the best manager. I'm a better leader than I am a manager. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we can get thing, more things done more effectively at, uh, with less time. I am all in. So if you would, so, so I presume they're in, or I don't know if they're in order of importance or just in order that you do things. So, um, just if you can, let's start with, uh, skill number one. Okay. And I want to, I want to make a comment if I can, Tom, I want to tell you all five skills. And then I want to comment on what you just asked about the, their relative importance, if I can. Sure. Okay, great. Absolutely. So the first one was commitment to building a team. The second is a fanatical custodian of time. The third is a willingness to seek and take advice. The fourth is an ability to set and adhere to priorities. And the last is an obsession with quality. And we can loop back and I, I, I love talking about this subject. So we can talk about any of them, but I just want to make one point, which came up after I'd written the book. I'd finished the book and I was working on the introduction 
and a, a mentor of mine at Harvard Business School, Michael Porter, had read through examples of the book and knew it pretty well. And he was looking through my introduction and he said, he said, David, you got this all wrong. I was like, oh, God, you know, because I'd had a thousand hours into this book and we're having a sandwich and a Diet Coke in his, his, his kitchen there. And I, I, I said, well, Professor Porter, what, what I got wrong here? And he said, you're thinking about this like it's a menu, that there are these different things that you can do and people can pick and choose. But in fact, what you've created is a is a, a unifying theory of execution. And Tom, just to go back to what we were talking about before, just like I can't say, well, you know, I don't want to hold the golf club right, but I will put my feet in the right direction. You, you got to put it all together for it to work. And he right. made a couple of points. He said, you know, you can't um, have an obsession for quality if you don't have a good team. You can't set it here, set and adhere to priorities if you're not good at managing your time and they all fit together. So that's a a long way of saying there actually is no ranking, but sure. I'd be happy to stop with start with commitment to building a team or whatever you'd like. You know, you know, let's start to that. Start with that, just because um, right now with the employment market, we're actually finding that the it, particularly in the professional services world, where and and uh, accounting in particular, we have fewer and fewer accountants entering the profession, more and more mm -hmm. accounts leaving the profession, which means we have fewer and fewer accountants, right? So um, that. Building a team is one of the hardest things that we do right now. So let's start with that one. Let's talk about um, the obsession with building a team. And, and I'd like to understand two things about that. First of all, the idea of it's an obsession with building a team. And the second is, okay, so how do you then go about building the team? And so that it is that great team. Mm -hmm. Well, especially with a professional services firm, you're really – Re, you're really selling labor, if you will. You know, your team is the product because a CPA firm, you know, CPA firms or professional services firm, they can buy the same, so they can all have the same software and they can all put in the numbers the same way. It's really that interface with the client that differentiates you from one professional service team, uh, services firm versus another. And so more than any other type of business, yeah, you know, the team is the product, if you will, is is really what I want to say. For sure. And we are in a we're in a we're in an incredibly competitive hiring market, and we're also in a, 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 a employment market that's going through massive change. As we think about you know kind of remote work and all the things that are going on since 2020, and all of that has upped the stakes. So when I when I looked at uh, building a team. In my MBA program at Stanford or at Harvard or Wharton or anywhere, basically any professor would say, you know, it's really important to surround yourself with good people and it's all about people, blah, blah, blah. And then the students leave the classroom. They're going, okay, but like, how do I do that? Right. So I broke it into the different steps. So for example, chapter one is how do you go through an interviewing process? Most people interview by gut feel. And it's a really sloppy way to do it. And it is why, in fact, there was a survey, which I cite in the book, The Manager's Handbook, a, a survey of 7,000 managers and 46% of these managers said that their, uh, that their hires failed within the first 18 months. That's our own self-reporting. And uh, by the way, only 19% achieved unequivocal success. So, we're, so we, you have to start with the humility that we're actually quite bad at hiring and spotting talent. And it comes with this, this notion of, well, I'm going to use my gut feel. So I love the story of that Malcolm Gladwell has in his more recent book, Talking with Strangers. And he discusses how Neville Chamberlain, who at the time was the prime minister of Britain, went to Germany to meet with the chancellor, Adolf Hitler. And he came back and he reported to the world and Britain, but really to the world, that Hitler was someone who could be trusted. And he cited the way Hitler, for example, shook his hand. And the demeanor that he had. And he said, I looked him in the eyes. Okay, well, obviously Hitler was a monster. And many, many people got Hitler wrong because he was extraordinarily charming in an interview. Because that's what it was. It was an interview, right? The person who got Hitler right was Winston Churchill. Why? Because Winston Churchill never met Hitler. He, in fact, just looked at data. And that's that. So that's the second mindset. First is we're bad at it. Second is you have to look at data. So the book walks through how you actually acquire data in a paint by numbers way. I didn't want to have any sort of large, you know, platitudes where okay, here's the concept. You go figure it out by yourself. So when you're asking questions, you look at 
things like the three peers. When you ask them for data, you say, well, how does that compare to P1, previous, plan, and peers? Just by way of example, Tom. So I want to so I walk people how you go through an interviewing process that more reflects how Steve Jobs interviewed or Sam Walton interviewed, which is why they surrounded themselves with amazing teams. And then I go to the next one, which is how do you onboard? And the next one is how do you give feedback? And the next one, how do you give feedback to someone who maybe is stumbling and might not have a place in your organization? How do you let someone go? How do you do 360 reviews? How do you do exit interviews? You put all of that together and you are going to be in the top 5% of building a team, but you got to have all those components that you pull together. So that's that's how the book is structured in, in not just in, in building a team, but throughout the whole book. You know, I, I love that, David, because uh, actually we were um, I, just a, a while back, we were having our annual uh, conference, um, uh, actually our uh, firm development conference at mm -hmm. WealthAbility. And uh, we actually had our, we have an HR professional on staff, and we are actually, I was actually interviewing her as well as our uh, recruiter because we have a recruiting company. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very interesting because I'm, I'm one of those terrible interviewers that, inter you know, I, I'm going, I always hire bad people because I hire people I like, right? Mm -hmm. It's that right. gut interview. And uh, our, our um, HR uh, professional, uh, Jessica, was saying, no, 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 no. No, you have to ask these questions. This is what you're doing. And she goes, don't, don't. <laughs> and then the recruiter pipes in and says, don't ever ask the what color Skittle would you be question. That's a stupid question. And uh, I don't know if you've heard that one, but it's a, it's a terrible, I, I mean, you know, it's like, or what, what animal would you be? Things like that. How does that relate to actually what they're doing? And, um, and I love that you're, you're kind of walking through that step-by-step -step because I do think we need the step-by-steps. I do think we need to actually plan out how we're going to interview because for a lot of people on this uh, call, uh, a lot of people listening are doing the interviews, even though they're not professional interviewers. Right. And so, you know, those, those simple steps are good. So I like that. I mean, kind of what I'm hearing is, look, you have to be professional about the interview process, professional about the, the management process, professional about the review process. And then, then you give the steps through. So let's, um, so we're, we're a little short on time. Let's kind of walk through. Uh, Tom, I just have to say this one thing though. Yes. Mine wasn't Skittles. I, my dumb question, which I asked for about 10 years was when you shut the refrigerator door, how do you know the light goes out? So there I had my, own, my own journey of a dumb question. <laughs> I was so proud of myself. I thought I was so clever. Right. I didn't, I didn't do anything. No. no. No, I, that's that's the thing, and I I think that's uh, that's critical. You know, I mean, I think the old adage, you know, hire slow and fire fast, is is a really good adage. I mean, we tend to fire too slowly, we tend to hire too fast, mm -hmm. and uh, and I love the methodical way. So basically, just really be methodical about it. Go through and follow the steps. So let's go. Uh, I want to get to uh, some of these others. Um, uh, number two on your list. Number two, number two on the list is a fanatical custodian of time. Okay, and so now, talk about that because I, I think that's uh, particularly challenging for financial professionals. Um, I actually find that um, we waste a lot of time, even though time is really, in a way, what we sell, right? I mean, even if we're not selling on an out, bill, billable hour rate, the more hours we devote to our clients, the more money we make. I mean, that's just the matter of the fact. We can produce more if we have more time to do other, you know, actually work with the clients. So how do we get that? How do we get that time uh, down so that we are being really fanatical about our time? A, a professional services uh, firm, like we were saying before, the people are the product. And every hour that ticks away that's unproductive is as if you have a machine that's that's not working. It's idle. You're, yep. you're mad, yeah, idle. How this whole thing started and how, where I first started pulling on this thread was I was having a cup of coffee with a good friend of mine, Tom Staggs, who at the time was the COO of Disney. So he had 250,000 people working, uh, reporting up to his organization. And I met him for coffee at Stanford campus and I'm kind of rushing. I'm a little bit late and I'm thinking about all the emails I haven't gotten done and blah, blah, blah. And Tom's just sitting there calm as a cucumber. I'm thinking you have a quarter of a million people in your organization and you're on time. I'm the one who's late. Right. And so I talked to Tom a little bit about it and he made two insights. One was he surrounds himself with good people, but he also said that he was very, very careful with his time. He didn't say that he 
said no, that he was protective, that, he, you know, he, he said he was he was careful with it and he spent it very uh, methodically or thoughtfully. Another person who's adamant about this, for example, is Bill Gates. And he talks about how he has the same amount of hours in the day as everybody else. So, okay, so that's fine. Everybody, you know, your listeners, you and I are nodding saying, yeah, that makes sense. But how do you go about doing it? So then my my real challenge was, okay, I'm not going to ask people to go buy an app or buy a special program or go to a three-day seminar on time. We end up always reverting back to what we did before. They don't work. So I studied the people who were really, really good at getting stuff done, and I looked at how they spent their day. And I, I, had, a, I had a head start because in an earlier conversation with Michael Porter, he said that he had done this study with a, a number of CEOs. I think it was, I can't remember exactly how many CEOs, but it was 70,000 pieces of data. Basically, they, the Harvard Business School followed these CEOs around in 15-minute increments and looked at how they spent their time. And I looked at what they did. I said, you know what? What they're doing doesn't require special apps or anything else. I, and I documented that. I want to give you a couple examples just to, just to give you a, an idea of, of, uh, of the impact of it. All right. We spend 23 hours a week in meetings. By the way, managers report that 50% of those are either ineffective or very ineffective. So that means we waste 12 hours a week. All right. One very simple thing. Take all those 30-minute meetings, make them 20 minutes. Make all those hour-long meetings, make them 40 minutes. If you, it, When I did that and I went back and looked at my calendar historically, it saved me 70 minutes every day. That's something your listeners could do tomorrow. As soon as they finish this podcast, they can just start. And by the way, there, there was a dividend to that, which me, made it more than 70 minutes, Tom, which is that when you set a meeting up for 11 o'clock to 11.20, guess what? Everybody's there at 11 o'clock. Everybody's ready to quit at 20, at, at 20 after because they assume there's something that you need to get to. And so we were really, really efficient. We weren't chatting around. People came prepared. So also, and then, and they don't go over. So I'm not even counting the amount of money I, or the amount of time I saved when that hour long meeting went to, you know, 70 minutes. So that would be an example. Okay, so shorter meetings. I like that. Shorter meetings. I talk about how to how to plan your day in a way that it takes about five minutes to plan a day. You don't need a special app. You don't need anything fancy on your computer because because that's what these CEOs that I looked at did, um, and how they planned out their day. And I am I would say I don't want to be I don't want to exaggerate it. I would say that I'm at least three times more effective with my day after having written that section in the book and studied well, these other it, people. It, it, it reminds me of. Uh... Uh, of the thought, and I do a lot of public speaking, is that it's much more difficult to write a 10-minute speech than it is to write a 30-minute speech and to, to deliver 30 minutes. So if you compress that time, you actually make that time more effective in the first place. I love that idea. So we've got, we've got team and we've got time. What's number three, David? So we've got team, we've got time, then a willingness to seek and take advice. And the way to think about this is that you want to make decisions quicker and you want to increase your hit rate of making the correct decision. And most problems that we all face as business owners have been faced by someone else before. The answer is out there. However, again, I, I don't want it to be just a platitude or an aspiration. So in the book, I talk about how do you go about finding advisors and mentors? How do you use them? When do you use them in a group setting? When do you use them on one-on-one -on -one setting? How do you go about asking questions from somebody that makes it effective? So for example, I spent a lot of time on the phone with my former students and also CEOs of companies that we're invested in now. We have about, about 50 companies we're invested in. And they'll call me up for advice or a student asks me for advice. And let's say we have a 20 minute time slot and fully 15 minutes, let's say, they're telling me the story, all the background. And then they say, and here's my problem. Well, I, and so then I sort of, start to ask the question and then they respond again. And I could literally be on a 20 minute call and only talk for four minutes, let's say. Sure. Well, it's fine. It's 20 minutes either way for me, but they didn't get the value that they wanted. So I create just a very simple formula on how you, when you're seeking and taking advice and you're talking to someone, the first thing is you have to start with what the problem you're trying to solve or the opportunity you're trying to take advantage of so that the other person on the other phone, uh, other end of the phone is holding that 
in their, they're holding that in their mind as they're hearing the background information. Then the second thing that you do is you give them the absolute minimum amount of information in order for them to help you with the problem. Because every minute that you're giving unnecessary background information is one less minute that they're not giving you advice. Then the third thing, which allows you to kind of miss low in step number two, is you ask for any clarifying questions. So that if you didn't give enough background or something wasn't clear, they have a chance to ask clarifying questions. And then you shut up and you just listen and take notes and let them talk, 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 talk. And then at the end, you close the loop and say, okay, this is what I think I understood you to say. Make sure you understand it right. And then the last thing that you do is at some point in the future, tell them what happened. Because uh -huh. the reward for an advisor is... They're kind of curious. They don't care whether you, I, I shouldn't say they don't care. They generally don't care whether you took their advice or not, but they are curious sort of what happened and just follow that formula. And when you make the phone call to that advisor that you're building a, a relationship with, you'll get so much more value out of it. But the other thing, Tom, is that if I called you for advice, what's the payback? The primary payback yeah. for you is you want to help me, right? Right. That's where your reward is. So if you hung up the phone after 20 minutes and you thought, you know, I really helped David out there. And I was really glad that I was able to draw on some pattern recognition and some experience I have and felt really good about that. Then when I call you six weeks later and say, Tom, I got another problem. Can you help me out? You're like, yeah, I would love to. I love to get calls from David because I really feel I, I, I get what I want. I get my itch scratched. So you're, build, you're building and nurturing this relationship along with getting better advice. Yeah. So that's just one example of, of, of how the book sort of steps it into or puts it into very, very simple steps. I love that. So we've got team, we've got time, we've got advice. I'm, I'm getting this down. Number four. Okay. Uh, the, the next one is an ability to set and adhere to priorities. And I'm sure everybody who's listening is sort of nodding because we're all spend so much of our time, you know, chasing the shiny objects or rushing over to the dumpster fires. And then at the end of the week, we go, okay, well, I really didn't work on the stuff that was really important to me, but next week, next, next week will be better. And uh, I love that one of my favorite chapters is a chapter about uh, having KPIs. And this the 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 best example I saw of this was once when I you know, Herb Kelleher he passed away but the guy who started Southwest Airlines mm -hmm. amazing entrepreneur and by the way he didn't invent anything okay he just out executed American Airlines and United Airlines and so forth which which is a theme of this book by the way and he and I were having a drink in Palo Alto California and he told me the story about when they were down to one hundred and forty three dollars in their checking account and. What he did is he said, we have to be focused on one thing, which is what he called the 10 minute turn. He said, planes don't make any money unless they're in the air. So we have to turn them around in 10 minutes. He got, he said, that is our priority. We're going to stick with it. It's the only thing we're going to do. And that 10 minute turn establishing what the KPI is, um, is what saved Southwest Airlines. So in our, my investment firm now, which is the closest parallel that we have to, you know, a professional services firm. I mean, obviously it is a professional services firm. We have our KPIs, you know, what really matters. And we say, this is what matters to our clients. This is what matters to building our business. Um, so it's a notion of KPIs. The second uh, chapter talks about how, to, how you build an operating plan. An operating plan is not a budget. A budget is just an Excel exercise on guessing what's going to happen next year. An operating plan is when you decide this is what's important, these are the three or four things we're going to work on, and everybody's uh, everybody adheres to that. The master of that was Steve Jobs. And so Steve Jobs was the person I went really deep with on how he would uh, set and adhere to priorities and how he had a process with his team, which would apply whether your team is five people or 500, five people, 500 people, or 50,000 people. It's the same thing, the process that he used. And I lay out his process for how you set and adhere to priority, how you set priorities, excuse me, Tom. And then what you do to adhere to priorities. I'll tell you a funny story. Johnny Ive, who was uh, Steve Jobs' uh, uh, chief designer for many, many years. So arguably kind of like the number two person. And I was so happy when I got to meet him, chat with him. And he tells this story about how Steve Jobs would spend in the rest of the year going around and going to the people who reported to him and reported to him and saying, what did you say no to today? And the, the reason for that is that setting priorities is not about not doing the things you shouldn't do. Setting and adhering to priorities is about not doing the things that you know in your heart is a great idea, 
But if you do that, you're not going to get to something that you're really working on. It reminds me of a of a quote, and I I honestly can't tell you who I can attribute it to because I don't know for sure. But um, it was a billionaire who said um, they got to a millionaire by saying yes, and they got to a billionaire by saying no. So I love that. Uh, that is that's great, Tom. It's one of my favorites. I, I suspect it was Warren Buffett, but who knows? A lot of things are attributed to Warren Buffett that I think are Warren Buffett's. But um, in any case, it's it's a it's to me the idea is. Look, you can you you get to a certain place, and I think one of the challenges we have is we got where we were because we said yes. Yeah. But we need to if we're going to expand, you know, uh, multiple times, we actually need to say no because other otherwise we get we get distracted. So I, I love that. So I want to wrap up number five. So don't want to leave off. They're all important. Um, again, the book is the manager's handbook. Five simple steps. So we've gone through four. We've got team, time, advice, and priorities. Number five, David. So five was the one that surprised me. And it snuck up on me towards the end of when I was going through this three-year uh, project, which is an obsession to quality. And I kept sort of looking over it, looking over it, looking over it until I realized, wait a minute, these people who are great at getting things done, they just don't sort of, it's, it's not a small thing quality. They are obsessed with quality, whether it's Sam Walton, or we were just talking about Steve Jobs. In fact, I do talk about Warren Buffett. Um, and and, and it, it was this obsession with quality that got me really interested in it. And what I realized, Tom, is that quality was, for them, quality was not about morality or ethics or taking care of their customers. Quality was about making money. That's why they had an obsession with quality. And it basically went like this, that you can, the, the most important thing is, especially for a personal services firm, right, is to keep the keep the clients you have and get more of their share of their wallet, all right? Well, the only way that you keep the clients that you have is by delivering a quality product. So quality drives revenue. The second thing is that, and this is, this is where going back to the story I was telling with Michael Porter about, about getting good people, the best people want to work for companies that deliver the best quality product. No good person wants to wants to deliver a B minus product. And so now you've got this flywheel effect, which is that you're attracting the better people because people are saying, I, I want to go work for Tom's company because, because he just kicks butt with his clients. And that's what I want to go home feeling like. I kick butt with my clients. Say. So you're, you're, you're making more money because you're keeping the existing clients. You're attracting better people. Uh, word of mouth has never been more important than now because it's not word of mouth, it's word of internet. Right. And good experiences and bad experiences fly through the cyberspace like never ever before. And so you can't keep mistakes a secret, but also your successes are less likely to be to be a secret. So I make the case about why quality is important. And then we talk about, for example, how you measure quality and uh, how you go about, uh, because measuring quality is not an NPS score. And I talk about, for example, Safe Light Auto Glass, which I think is amazing at how they measure quality. And I talk about Intuit, the company that does turbo. Well, of course, all your all, all your listeners know who Intuit is. Intuit is masterful about how they measure quality. Uh, and they have very specific t techniques about, about how they do it. And so I look, talk about measuring quality and, and, each cha and there's four chapters in quality. It happens to be my personal favorite um, of all the chapters, because I think it's the it's the secret weapon that so many uh, companies don't fully appreciate, uh, because they everybody has an inflated view of their quality. Uh, there was this great Bain study where uh, they asked people um, uh, about their they asked CEOs about their quality. Eighty percent of them thought they offered a superior customer experience. All right, here's the punchline, Tom. Only eight percent of their customers agreed with them. Wow. Wow. That, that is a disconnect. If, yeah. <laughs> if I've ever heard one, right? There's a disconnect with the customer. So um, again, the book is the manager's handbook, five simple steps. And I love the steps and I love that you break them down, David. Thank you very much. Um, any final words for our listeners? My final word is that uh, the big aha for me at the very end of the book was the one thing that I mentioned about how they integrate all together. And then the second thing was when I was talking to a friend who runs a really big real estate firm and he asked me, what companies uh, 
use these five skills. And I had always thought about it in terms of individuals, individual business leaders. And that was the light bulb that went off when I realized if you really want to turbocharge the organization, you learn these five skills and then you become a teacher and you teach them to your staff because it's one thing for you to be running a good meeting or you to be a good custodian of your time. Imagine the power when all of your employees are in, are, are uh, harnessing these skills. No, I, I love it. We uh, the, Again, team, time, advice, priorities, and uh, my also my personal favorite, an obsession with quality. So thank you, David Dodson. Again, the manager's handbook, uh, this this what an amazing opportunity to really get a step by step on how to uh, increase your effectiveness and multiply your effectiveness. And just remember, when we do these things, when we when we have the 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 best team and actually manage the best team when we when we pay attention to our time, you know, when we get the good advice from the right mentors, um, really get that those KPIs down or that one KPI um, that measures our, you know, really says, here's what our priorities are and have that obsession with um, with quality. We're always going to start with better clients. Then we're going to have a better practice and we're going to end with a better life. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com. 